Romans chapter 15 this morning. Happy Easter. As we get into God's Word, I have to admit that uh, this message is a little bit different than any message I've ever preached on Easter. Of course, on Easter, we're going to focus and talk about the resurrection of Christ and the life-giving power that comes from Christ. And what an awesome, awesome thing to be in God's house this morning as the church, right? Uh, as you're getting to Romans 15, 13, I just want to tell you that we're going to talk about hope this morning. We're going to talk about hope, and while you turn there, I, I just want to say this. There, there are a lot of different ways that we look at hope, I think. Uh, sometimes we kind of live uh, with oblivious hope, with um, kind of this optimistic hope that things are going to work out sometimes, and, and then they don't, like I like like in the fourth grade, and you ask the girl if she wants to go with you, go with you, you know, I hope she will say yes. You know, you're kind of living with that kind of, kind of hope. Uh, there was this man who, uh, who walked up on a little league uh, baseball game one afternoon, and he, he walked up to the dugout, and he asked the little boy in the dugout what the score was, and the boy responded, it, it's 18 to nothing, and we're behind. And the, the spectator said, well, I'll bet you're discouraged. And the little boy looked at him and he said, why should I be discouraged? We haven't gotten up to bat yet. And so some of y'all get that about halfway home this afternoon. I, I think sometimes we can have this optimistic hope that things are going to work out, that things will, you know, things will be all right. Um, but yet we, we kind of lose sight of reality sometimes. Um, and, and then there's also the kind of hope that maybe when something bad is going on, anybody ever walk through some tough things? Okay, half of you are lying if you didn't raise your hand. So you've walked through some tough things, you've gone through some hard things, and we kind of have that, that, that optimism, that hope that will, you know, Lord, maybe, maybe things will be all right. You know, maybe, maybe the marriage will get better. Um, maybe things at work will, will be okay. Um, I can I can remember a, a lot of times thinking, Lord, this has just got to this has just got to get better. And then there are also those times I think maybe where if we were just honest, we feel hopeless. Have you ever been there? Like I just don't see how you're at work in this at all, God. I, I don't see how this can get better. Ever been there? You ever, if we're if we're just if we're just honest. And, and I think that the realization is this, if we trust in our holy God, if we trust in the God who is hope, then we would agree with this, that there are no hopeless situations. There are only people who have grown hopeless about them, right? Um, and for me, I don't know about you, I'm just being real honest this morning, I, have, I find myself as a believer in knowing that I have a relationship with the one who authors hope, who is hope, but I also find myself on the other side of that kind of having to work at hope sometimes, kind of having to, to trudge through it and realize and remember the hope that I have. You understand what I'm saying? Um, I, I coach a lot of little league uh, sports I have over the last several years, and uh, I love to coach basketball. And one thing, that, uh, one thing that I make my basketball teams do, and any of you that played sports or you've coached a little bit, I'd, I'd have my basketball team run dead men. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Different names for different, you know, different ages, but we call them dead men now. And so, you know, a dead man, you start off at the end and you run, you know, and you hit the line, and you've got to hit the line, you've got to go back, and you've got to go to half court and hit the line and back. You know what I'm talking about? You're running dead men. And, uh, and so a lot of times the kids, we would run these dead men, and the kids would say, you know, why are we doing this? You know, it makes my legs feel like rocks, coach. You know, why are we, why are we running dead men? This is torture. This is hard. And the hope in running dead men is that it prepares you for the games. I would tell the boys a lot of times, you know, we may not be able to score, but we're going to outlast the other team until they die, and then we'll win the game, right? I mean, we, we, will, we will be in shape. And so... I think we, in our culture, a lot of times, we, don't, we, we live in a culture, I think, that increasingly is not realizing the value of hard work, the value of the grind, the practice, and how it impacts the big picture. I mean, for most, the way you play in the game is going to reflect how you practiced. I understand there are some people who are incredibly talented, and they can walk on a court, or they can walk on a field, and they can do whatever they want, because God just made them that way. 
Okay, but for most, how you practice is how you're going to play. If you, if you work hard and practice, it's going it's to pay off. And so I, I find, for me, that I kind of have to trudge through. I have to run the dead men of life in remembering when I'm in the middle of problems, in the middle of the storms of life, to remember that my hope is in Christ. I have to work at that and remind myself. Uh, in his book, The Good and Beautiful God, James Bryan Smith says, Our thoughts about God will determine not only who we are, but how we live. And I have to remind myself of who God is a lot of times and remind myself of what God has done for me in order to trudge through the problems of life. I guess what I'm trying to say this morning on Easter Sunday is that if we see God as so little, and if we put our hope elsewhere, if we don't see God as the God of hope that He really is, just, just like preparing and doing dead men to get better, if we aren't placing our hope in the one who made hope, do you believe that God made hope? Then we're just playing at life. And we're never really preparing for the game. I'm going to get you exercising this morning. Let's, let's run some dead men together. I won't make you do that, but let's stand up for just a second. If you would, just stand with me one more time. I know we just sat down, but let's do this. Let's honor the Lord with this verse. Romans 15, 13. This is our key verse today, Romans 15, 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and for the next few minutes we are going to trudge through your word, Lord. We are going to dig deep in it. And Lord, we are going to realize this morning, Lord, that the very one who is hope desires for us to abound in hope. And so, Lord, would you just uh, prepare our hearts for your word? Lord, would you, uh, as Harris prayed, Lord, would you revive believers in this room? And Lord, if there is anyone here who does not believe, Lord, would you open their hearts to your word? Let them see who you are and what you have done. Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Look, you can be seated. Take a second, turn to your neighbor, tell them they look great on Easter. You're good looking. You're awesome. I like your pink shirt. This is the day all the guys wear pink shirts and we feel okay about it, right? Listen, as we, uh, as we dig into this, as we look at Romans 15, 13, I have to, to say, um, I, we were t I was talking about this verse last week. Uh, one of our elders, our, our, and he's our college pastor, Miles Newton, I'm going to pick on him this morning. He and I were, we were talking last week about our, about our message today for Easter. And as we were sitting at Dairy Queen last Sunday, it, that's where we had our conversation. And while I was watching him eat a blizzard, okay, um, I was the one being holy that night. I, I was trying to be healthy and holy. Uh, he was trying to be sinful and satisfied. And, uh, and so that, that's not me and my jealousy, but I was sitting there watching him eat this blizzard, this, this brownie, caramel, decadent blizzard, whatever he had. And he said, I'm really excited about Easter. And I said, I'm really excited about the fact that you're eating that blizzard in front of me and I'm drinking a cup of water. And, uh, and I, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do what's right. And he said, he said, no, I'm really excited about hope. He said, because when you talk about hope, we have to realize that hope is often treated like the third sister. We tend to forget as Christians about true hope. Um, you know, more than anyone else in the world, I just want to say to us, church, if you know Jesus Christ, we have hope. But a lot of times, here's the honest truth, we sure don't live like it. Um, you know, Jesus said, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, so faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So the greatest is love. I mean, we talk about love a lot uh, as Christians. And last week, what did we talk about? If you were here, we're walking, by the way, if you're here for the first time, we're walking through James. We've just taken a week off this week, but we're walking verse by verse through James, and James talks all about faith. And so last week, we talked about uh, authentic, genuine faith. And so we talk about love all the time. We talk about faith. But when it comes to, to hope, I think that hoping in God doesn't come naturally for those of us who have fallen short of the glory of God, who are sinners, and who is that? That's everybody. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners, and so we have to preach hope to ourselves, and we have to teach hope to ourselves, or eventually we give way to a downcast and an unfocused spirit. 
I love Psalm 42, verse 5. If you're taking notes, just jot it down. You don't have to turn there. But Psalm 42, verse 5 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation. Being a Christian really leaves us at the crosshairs of several realities about Jesus. Just, just think about this with me for a minute. As a Christian, we, we're in the crosshairs of all these realities. One, that He is the eternal Son of God, fully a part of the, of the, of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God His Holy Spirit. We're in the crosshairs of understanding that Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth and all galaxies and planets and anything that exists that God made it. Jesus made it and that he created us and that we are made in the image of God. If you're a human being, you're special. You're created in God's image. There's also the reality, the, another crosshair we stand in is the reality that we sinned and we rebelled against God which separated us from him. And our penalty for sin is hell forever, separated from God. But God, listen to this, here's the awesome thing, but God, out of His sovereignty, out of His love for us, out of His power, out of His full sufficiency, God gives us hope through Jesus Christ. God came to earth. God the Son left the glory of heaven and was born as a baby in human form. The Son came and he, he came to, to live with us and, and, and to be with us. So he was born on this earth, get this, because he is God. He came fully human, yet he was still fully God. And I can't stand up here and tell you that I completely comprehend that or understand it. Yet I trust it because he is God. I mean, he ate, he slept, he got out of breath, he got hot, he got cold, and yet he could heal the sick and he could heal the blind and he could make people change their lives on a dime. Because while he was fully human, he was fully God. Yet, even though he had been born among us and lived among us, the penalty had not yet been paid for our sin. Sinful people separated from God. We needed a way to know him, didn't we? Um, a way made by God. We needed a way to be saved and not go to hell. A, a way that none of us could ever create or come up with. A way to not be separated from God because of our sin. So Jesus died for our sin. God died for our sin. God the Son died. And that's, that's why it's called Good Friday. He, he did something that was awful in order to do something good. I, you know, growing up, I didn't quite comprehend why Friday, the Friday Jesus died was called Good Friday. I mean, because a lot of awful things happened that day. Jesus was, was crucified, and crucifixion is the worst death that anyone could ever face. He endured a martyr's death that we deserved. The worst death there ever was, crucifixion. He was put to death. And he did it so we could be saved. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus was killed. He died. He, he was put in a grave. You know, besides the Bible, countless witnesses and historical records prove it. And three days later, the Scripture says that he rose from the grave, fully alive. Can we comprehend it? No. I mean, how, how could it have happened? How could something like that happen? Because he is God. And the last time I checked, God can do what he wants. Because he's God. And, and, and he wanted us to have hope. So he didn't stay dead. He raised up and conquered death, the death that sin caused. Hope came to life. So this morning on Easter Sunday, we remember that what Jesus did, he did so we could have hope. And if you really know Jesus, then you understand that as Christians, as believers, that we also look forward with longing and expectation for his return, for the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus will come back again. We, we live in the promised, undoubtable hope of eternity with Jesus Christ, forever and ever, in paradise with our Savior, where hope will be the reality forever and ever and ever. And when we think there's no more ever, there's some more ever and ever and ever, right? Sometimes in life, just to be honest, hope can be brought down by disappointment, can it? Have you, have you ever opened a gift? Let's just go here for a second. Have you ever opened a gift and been disappointed? Come on. Ever opened a gift and been disappointed? It's kind of ironic, though, that I mean, we are selfish people. I mean, we are, you know, 
we are selfish people. It's kind of ironic that we would get a gift and then be disappointed that we got a gift, but it happens. Think, think back to when you were a kid. You wanted that video game or that toy or that car or that doll. Or let's just get honest. Adults, last year you wanted an Apple Watch or you wanted that new phone or that power tool or that gift card that you didn't get. You ripped the paper off the gift with great eagerness, anticipation, and delight, and all the hope that you could put into this, and it wasn't what you wanted, right? And, and just think about a kid who's been wanting that toy that he's been dreaming of. It's just like the, the kid on that movie, A Christmas Carol, who wanted the Red Ryder BB gun, and, and that's not, you know, it, he, he just was afraid it wasn't going to work out. That, that kid that's longing for the Xbox, and when he opens the box, it's a shirt, or it's a pair of socks. Or even worse, it's a scientific calculator. I realize, I get it, I realize that for some of you, a scientific calculator is like a dream gift. You're an accountant. And you, you're the life of the party. A calculator is what you wanted. It's what you always wanted. But for a lot of kids, another pair of socks or a pack of underwear or a calculator is utterly disappointing, isn't it? Not saying it should be, but it is, and that's why most kids, instead of using calculators the way that they're supposed to be used, most kids, instead of using them for math, they turn them upside down and try to figure out what kind of dirty words they can spell with the numbers and do it upside down. Anybody else do that? Come on. Did you do it? Come on. You've been there. You tried to see if you could spell a dirty word upside down with the numbers on the calculator. Look, you know, you know what it felt like to get the gift that looks like a new Xbox, but when you open it, it's a box of underwear. You've been there, right? The point is, is that, that we, even as adults, in real life every day, we are all the time longing, waiting, hoping, eagerly anticipating what this or that situation will be, hoping it will be what we want it to be only to be at the end disappointed, only in the end to be let down. You know, the gift example that I just gave is kind of a, 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 kind of a microcosm that can tell bigger stories in all of our lives. This idea, just jot this down, this idea of misplaced hope. Hear me today, misplaced hope. You've done it, I've done it, you're doing it, I'm doing it. There are things and people and situations that we are placing our hope in that ultimately will disappoint us. For some of us, we're putting our hopes in another person or in people or in government or in an ideology or in a system. We're putting our hope in things or projected images. We're putting it in things like success or a future promotion or we're putting our hope uh, you know, for entrance into this college or to get this kind of job or this club or this notoriety or this kind of wealth or this kind of success or this popularity or this acceptance. We are placing hopes in a thousand different things. But hope was never meant to be put in those things. It was never meant to be there. Think about where you and I are placing our hopes. Think about where you and I are putting hope that, and just hoping that things are going to work out a certain way. That it's going to fill us up and satisfy an aching and a longing in our souls. That it's going to deliver us. And maybe there's some good things, no doubt. Maybe some of those are good things, but we're putting our hope there. And hope was never meant to be put there. In reality, all things this side of heaven that we could put our hope in are broken, and to some degree, they leak. Anything we could put our hope in other than God, who is hope, leaks. It's broken. The, I traded my, my, my little gray truck not long ago. My gray truck, I loved it. It had tons of miles on it, and I wanted to put tons more. I wanted to break a world record. I was going to drive it for a lot more years. But I decided to go ahead and trade it and get something different. Why? Because it was leaking oil. I, I was having to put a quart a week in it. It was time to go a different direction. My hopes of putting all those miles on it were just not sustainable unless I was willing to sink some money into it and I'm the cheapest guy this side of the Mississippi and I wasn't going to do it. The, the question I want to try to answer this morning, if everything we know in this life is broken and it leaks hope, if everything, every circumstance, everyone we know 
If everyone we know can, does, and will let us down, if everything we could do could disappoint us and fail us, then what or who can hold our hope? If you think about the word hope, it's a word that's a part of our daily vocabulary. We use that word all the time. We hope it stops raining. We hope the in-laws leave soon. We hope the Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter pounds will shed off nice and easy before summer gets here because we got to show off the 43-year-old man bod, right? We hope the kids do okay in school. We hope, we hope, we hope. We use it all the time. In the Scriptures, the word hope is used over 200 times. In in the Scriptures, you begin to see how the word hope is used throughout the, the whole Bible. It can be summarized by saying something like this, hope means a confident expectation in the future. That's just a simple definition of it. If you look at it biblically, hope is a confident expectation in the future. It means a contagious enthusiasm of believing and knowing that something will come. The idea of hope is that you're looking forward with future enthusiasm, with confidence, with expectation that there is blessing on the other end of this life. And for a believer, that means hope is a good thing. If we ask the question, if everything... Every circumstance, everyone, if, every, if all of that can let me down, if everything I could put my hope in is broken and leaky, then who or what can I put my hope in? And with that, we can easily go back to Romans fifteen thirteen, where we started today. Now, I don't, I don't normally preach like this, pulling one verse out of the middle of nowhere. Like I said, we're in a series, and we're walking through James as a church, but, but God just put me here this morning. So to pull a verse for one day, just very quickly, we need some background. If you're not familiar with Romans and where we are in Romans 15, 13, the, the book of Romans is Paul's crown jewel. Paul wrote this, and it's his crown jewel. The first 11 chapters of Romans, he was writing to Jews in Rome. And he gives this, this very thorough outline of Christian theology. He tells them why we are lost without Christ, why we are headed to hell if we don't know Jesus, why we need to be saved, how we can be saved, and how our gracious God made a way for that to happen. But then from chapter 12 on, he starts writing about daily living as a follower of Christ. If you know Christ, then this is daily living. This is how you you do this. And in the midst of these later chapters, chapter 12 on, Paul Paul right here sets down the pen and, and he, he breathes out a prayer for his people. In Romans 15, 13, our verse for today is sort of a benediction or a closing to that prayer. In this closing, Paul expresses hope for the church. L- look at it again. Verse 13, he says, this is the benediction to the prayer. He says, may the God of hope, author of hope, right? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. All right, very quickly, we don't have a ton of time, but let's break it down. I don't mean like break it down like break dance like that, but I mean let's break it down for just a second. It says, may the God of hope. Here's my point. If we walk away with this today, then we get it. Praise the Lord. Paul obviously understood, and I want us to see plainly today, that God is both the source of our hope and the supplier of our hope. You you see this fact right out of the gate. He says, may the God... Of hope. You know, if you flesh that out, all the hope that I can have down here at this level, all all the misplaced hopes like we talked about, things that are probabilities, I think I have a really good shot at this promotion. I think if I put this much away in my 401k and it grows this much interest, then I should have this type of nest, nest egg when I retire. All of those things are hopes down at this level. Whenever you're placing hope in a person or a thing, a system or a spouse, whatever it is, you're banking on probabilities, but with God, hope is always different. You're banking on promises that will be true. They are true, they always have been true, and they will come true. And you're banking on promises God himself has made. In the book of Titus, the Apostle Paul says, and this is a God who cannot lie. Listen to Titus 1, 1 through 3 very quickly. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. See, hope in God is not based on probabilities but it's based on promises. May the God... 
of hope. May he, may he what? May he fill you. May he overflow you with what? With joy and peace is what he says. Do you want joy and do you want peace? This morning, when Paul talks about joy, he, he uses that word more than anybody else in the, in the New Testament. 21 times the Apostle Paul is going to speak of joy. It, joy is a mark of the Christian. True joy. He's not talking about bubbly, a bubbly personality type. He's not talking about a disposition that is fake, cheerful. He's not talking about that. He is talking about something that only a Christian can have, and that is a deep abiding joy in the soul of a person because they have met God and they know their Creator. They've been forgiven and redeemed by Jesus. He's talking about an inward, not an outward veneer, satisfaction of the soul that wells up in the delight of knowing He is my God and I am His son or I am His daughter. And in peace, he's talking about joy, but he's also talking about peace. He's not talking about the inward satisfaction of the soul. He's talking about the inward settledness of the soul. A Christian has something that someone who is not saved does not have and cannot have, and that is rest and contentment and an ease of the soul that come what may, come what may in this life, take all this, let the world around me fail, But come what may, I know Jesus Christ and I am eternally secure. I have peace that is a peace that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit and it surpasses all understanding. A believer has that and a lost person doesn't. I love what Charles Spurgeon says about this verse. He describes it this way. He said, peace is resting joy. Joy is dancing peace. Joy cries Hosanna before the well-beloved, but peace leans her head on his bosom. We work with joy and we rest with peace. Joy and peace working together. And that's what Paul says he longs for us to have. Um, And it's shown in the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, joy and peace are two of the the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, The fruit, and you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it's just like apples on an apple tree. You know it, you know an apple tree is an apple tree because there are apples on it. You know a believer is a believer because they start having the fruits in their life. There's joy and there's peace and there's all these other things that that he talked about in Galatians chapter 5. And so Paul says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace. Joy and peace in what? Joy and peace in believing is what that verse says. Paul's been arguing all throughout the book of Romans that although we were condemned to eternal death because of our sin, God made a way for us to live. Do you believe that, church? One way, a narrow way. How? Only through the Son. Romans 5.8 says that God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Scripture says that no man can come unto the Father unless he comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So he's saying, As you believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation, as you believe on the one who died on the cross for your sins, as you believe on the one who rose from the dead, that's Easter, as you believe that He will return one day, As you believe in Him, as you place your love and your trust in Jesus Christ, the Spirit is at work within you, producing the fruit of the Spirit. Things like peace and joy. Other things like love and patience. And he he goes on in our verse today, and he noticed, he said he wants this for all of you so that. He uses these words, so that. So that. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You can see here now that this prayer, this benediction is bookended with hope. It begins with hope, may the God of hope, and it ends with hope. May you abound in hope. A verse that ends with hope and that begins with hope and ends with hope. I I just want you to see that Paul, in this incredible one-line prayer, is showing us something that's absolutely amazing. That the God of hope is longing for us to abound in hope, to be a people of hope. Hope to hope. The the good news about the one who supplies hope is that he has an abundant supply of it. God's hope never runs out. As hope grows up in you, wells in you, spreads in you, you realize that he has far more still for you. You're never going to quit growing this side of heaven. God still has more hope for you. And and I just want to apply this truth to two categories before we go this morning, before we we go our ways and spend the afternoon with family or friends or whatever we do today. One is for the Christian and one is for the non-Christian. Let's get real serious here for just a second because I want to address both very, very quickly. For Christians sitting in this room this morning, there are a lot of believers in this room this morning. I, I would ask you to consider what are your daily hopes being put in 
A couple of weeks ago as a church, and if you weren't here, I just want to tell you, a couple of weeks ago as a church, we got, we got pretty honest with ourselves sitting in this room a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about the need for revival in God's church, about God's people being revived. And so if you're, if you're realizing and you gauge your life and you look, you know, you know, my daily hopes, I'm putting them in a lot of other things besides Christ. I know Jesus. He's my, he's, you know, I'm a Christian. He's my Savior. But I'm struggling in that. I would urge you to do a few things. And this is pretty straightforward. I would urge you to spend more time in the Word of God. I would just straight up challenge you seven days a week, take seven times each week and get in God's Word. Make that commitment. Se- secondly, I would say pray more. S- you know, there again, seven times a week intentionally. Put, a- put aside some time for prayer because as you're in God's Word and as you pray more, the fog begins to clear up a little bit. It- it- you... you-, you- get focused more on the one who is hope. And you start seeing those things that you're not going to be immune to as a Christian. You're not going to be immune from problems and situations and struggles and things that go wrong. But you have Jesus to walk through those things with you. And so as you get in His Word and as you pray, that it begins to clear up the fog a little bit. You know, and third, I would encourage you to do this. Identify some of the misplaced hopes that you have in your life. Be honest with yourself and be honest with the Lord. Keep remembering that everything this side of heaven is leaky and broken to some degree, and that's why you needed Jesus to start with, because He's the only one that doesn't leak. You begin, to, to say, begin to say to yourself, No, Lord, I know who I am in Christ, and what I've been thinking is not true. No, no Lord, there, I remember there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. As I walk, Lord, as I walk through the valley of, shadow, of the shadow of death, I do remember you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Lord, you know, I don't feel like it, but I am a new creation in Christ. You know, I feel dirty, I feel full of shame, but I'm a new creation in Christ. Remind yourself of who you are in Christ. Get in His Word and and pray and be honest. And then I would say this, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm confident that there are probably some folks here who don't know Jesus as your Savior, and I want to just say welcome. I'm glad you're here this morning. You, you may be here with family today. You may have come with a friend. You may not even know why you showed up, but God knows why you're here. God's known all along you would be here today. But if I were to ask you if you really know Jesus, you, you couldn't answer that question with assurance. If I were to ask you, do you know that you would go to heaven, you, you wouldn't be able to answer that. But God made a way. And, and you can know that. And it's only through Christ. And so I would encourage you, if you're here this morning, look, talk to someone. Talk to someone, maybe whoever invited you. Or come see me, or, or come talk to someone, and we will tell you what, what God's Word, not what we made up or not what we're saying, but what God's Word says, what God says about Himself, and what God says about being saved and having a relationship with Him. We'll, we'll tell you that. And that's the appeal that God is making to you right now. He's saying you can be reconciled to Him. That, that's, the, that's the appeal he's making. It's, you know, our souls will go on forever. It's just either with God or apart from God. I want you to know God, and I want your, I want your soul to be with God for eternity. So that's, that's, the, that's the invitation to you right now. He, he's offering you righteousness, and, and, and I promise the hope that God gives, it's not an Xbox, and it's not a box of socks either. It, it is something eternal. It is something eternal. Hope came to life. Romans 15, 13. Listen, our worship band's going to come and we're going to sing one more song before we go this morning, before we leave and, and, and head our separate ways. And as we do this, um, as we sing this last song, this, uh, this song that we're going to sing is, is, a new, uh, is a new song. We've never sung it before uh, as, a, you know, as a body, as the church. The message in it is absolutely incredible, though. And so I, I just want to invite you. I don't want to weird anybody out. Maybe you're at church for the first time or whatever. But you've heard all this and you say, look, I, I'd like to talk to somebody. I'd like to, know, um, I'd like to know what it means to know Christ. And I wish somebody would tell me. Look, we would be here available for you. We're not going to make you give a speech or stand up in front of the church or anything like that. But if you'd like to talk to somebody, we are here and available. Um, listen, I would encourage believers as a time of prayer. If you would like to come and pray, 
Um, you can pray where you are, but maybe you want to just kind of come and get alone with God and kneel down before him, then come and do that. This is a time of intentional invitation. We're going to take four or five minutes, four or five minutes here and sing, and maybe you'll kind of learn the words to this song and, and, and see what it's saying. We might even kind of come back together and, and, and sing a bit of it at the end. But it's an intentional time for prayer. If you need somebody to talk to, come and tell us. We're standing right here. We'll be right here for you. If you want to just come and pray, church, come and do that. Let's stand, let's sing before we go, okay?